I will make the introduction. Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Pavilion of Turkey. Uh, this week on Mardia project, we are uh, having the 11th shift. And uh, today we are honored to host our fifth keynote speaker, uh, Peter Eisenman. Uh, Peter Eisenman is an architect and educator uh, who I think uh, does not need a formal uh, introduction. And uh, he is a founder of Eisenman Architects and a professor in practice at Yale University. And uh, he's one of the major uh, characters in architecture who is challenge constantly challenging the discourse uh, with his buildings and uh, books. Uh, I mean, I would like I mean, this will be in a discussion format. I mean, I would encourage everyone to jump into the conversation like or uh, whenever you like. Uh, I mean, to start with, I would like to. Uh, Considering your long experience with the biennials, uh, we, I would like to start with the questions that we actually started doing the, this Bardia project, which was what is actually the biennials are and what the biennials are for and for whom the biennials uh, are basically. So if you could give some like uh, your thoughts on it, yeah. that would be. First of all, everybody should put the notes away. I'm not saying anything that needs to be written down. Much better to be here than writing notes. If I see people writing notes, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Um, it's um, the Biennale to me as an architect who has lived through uh, most of them used to be a very important event. Uh, there are two events in Italy that happen uh, in alternate years. One is the Biennale of Venice, and the other is the Milan Triennale. The Triennale is an older, uh, it has a garden like the Giardini here, and used to be the most important architecture uh, exhibition in the world. Um, I would argue that the 1973 Triennale, um, curated by Aldo Rossi, was probably the most important event of the 70s in, a, in, a, in an era that was very important to architecture. And Rossi, um, had been appointed um, in, in a very strange way by a man called Paolo Portoghese. And Paolo Portoghese was the dean of the School of Architecture in Milano. Uh, and even though Rossi was not uh, in the same uh, side of uh, the debates, uh, he picked Rossi uh, to be the head of the, the Triennale in 73. Rossi, um, obviously you all know who he is, but he, to me, is one of the most important architects in the world in the last half of the 20th century. That is from 1950 to the year 2000. Um, at the same time, uh, in 1976, Vittorio Gregotti, D organized the first archi international architecture biennale in 76. And uh, it was called uh, Europa America. So there were 11 architects from the United States and 11 architects from Europe. Uh, and to me, that was also a very important uh, exhibition. The 73 exhibition was brought together two different groups of thinking uh, in the world of architecture. The, they were called the RADs and the RATs. The RADs were radicals and the RATs were rationalists. So this was a, a title that everybody used, the RATs and the RADs. Uh, the RADs were people like Adolfo Natalini and uh, uh, 
Ranzi from Italy uh, representing ArchiZoom and uh, various other kind of uh, radical ideas of the city. The rats were rationalists and did uh, brought together any number of people, including Leon Creer and myself uh, as part of the uh, Triennale. Um, there's no question that the Triennale uh, was sort of brought these two um, ideas together into sort of juxtaposition. And then I think that's really what these exhibitions used to be about. They used to be about the best architectural ideas in the world uh, confronting one another, whether it was radicals versus rationalists, whether it was Europe versus America, the city versus the suburb. Uh, these were really important events. In the 76 Biennale, uh, there was a famous encounter between the Dutch architect Aldo van Eyck uh, and Manfredo Tafuri, the Italian critic. Uh, and van Eyck accused Tafuri and the other rationalists of being fascists. And of course, uh, fascism and rationalism had its roots uh, in uh, Italy of the 20s and 30s. And, and so the people who were anti-rationalists, basically like uh, Aldo van Eyck and others, were also anti-modernist. And these were the ideas that were operative between, let's say, 1960 and 1980. It was a period of, of fomentation and uh, discussion and radical thinking about architecture after modern architecture. Any of you who have studied modern architecture should know uh, the four, what I call the four famous architects of that period, which were Aldo Rossi, Matthias Ungers, Jim Sterling, and Robert Venturi. Venturi, recently deceased last week, uh, brought to me an end to, of that particular era. Uh, they would never, those four, have had you all sitting here with uh, computers uh, <clears throat> studying. They would have you out thinking and looking and drawing uh, as you walked around Venice. Uh, and so uh, we have to realize how far the world has shifted uh, from what was happening in the 60s and 70s and what is happening uh, today. Um, and uh, the fact that you're sitting inside listening to me instead of being outside looking at architecture uh, is symbolic of the situation that we all find ourselves in today. That is, what are the critical ideas that are animating architecture? And um, we don't know what they are. Um, and the people who are the critical voices uh, have, in a sense, long since left the uh, scene of architecture. So for me, the Biennale was always about architecture for architects. Uh, how many people came was irrelevant. Uh, it's like the art Biennale. The artists always could understand where their discipline was uh, through who was chosen uh, to be uh, in the uh, organizing the Biennale. The Biennale used to be organized by important architects. Uh, Aldo Rossi was one, Hans Hollein was another, uh, but now the, the, we have diversity uh, as opposed to important, and we pay attention to uh, people from underrepresented countries like Turkey, uh, like uh, Nigeria, like Korea, etc., as opposed 
to uh, the, 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 the important people uh, who uh, are in the critical forefront of architecture. So I think architecture has changed. Um, it's now about uh, popular ideas. It's about uh, shape making. It's about object making. It's about uh, all kinds of things that can be done on uh, computer uh, algorithms and uh, very little to do with the critical nature of what is architecture in this, the social and political atmosphere of today. Uh, nobody really knows what that is. Um, and uh, I think Turkey is a very important country uh, today because it stands between, in a sense, the East and the West. Uh, it's very unclear where Turkey is going to end up. Uh, and I always thought because it had a very strong middle class uh, that it would end up uh, in the world of the future uh, rather than the world of the past. That remains to be uh, seen. I'm not here to talk politics about Turkey. I, I'm really interested in hearing what you all think or having questions from you all uh, about uh, architecture. I don't think the pavilion, the Turkish pavilion, let's say, or any of them are about uh, the audience. I think they are about uh, learning uh, for architects uh, about architecture. Um, I wish there were more um, what I consider my heroes uh, in charge of the Biennale. Um, and um, I think the Biennale has lost that kind of energy, the same with the Milan Triennale. Uh, the last, I think, important uh, Biennale was in 1980, was Paolo Portoghese's, Paolo Portoghese's uh, Strada Novissima, uh, which had most of the important architects of the world uh, participating. Um, I know that uh, Frank Gehry and I represented the United States in the 1991 Biennale uh, in the U.S. Pavilion. Um, I think it was the last time that um, white male uh, architects uh, represented the United States, um, and um, so much so for uh, diversity. But um, so I'm, as it were, uncertain as to what my message would be to you all, because I think the world is is wide open for your generation. I think. There's nobody that knows anything more or less than you know. I don't think you can be an architect in the world ever, no matter whatever country you're from, whatever gender, whatever uh, uh, political belief, if you don't know precedent. And to me, precedents are really important and you are in a city where there are enormous precedents, that it's impossible uh, not to, uh, in fact, come and understand those precedents. So that's why I really feel uh, very important for you to get out and, and just walk the streets of Venice. There's a, a book by uh, uh, a, a woman who, which was put out in the 1950s uh, called uh, Venezia Minore, Minor Venice. And Venezia Minore was a book that I used in 1961, uh, which was over 50 years ago. Uh, and the book is still relevant today. You can get it in bookstalls for 10 euros, I imagine. <clears throat> And it's by a woman called Trinquenato. And you just walk the streets 
of Venice, looking at the architecture, and you can understand the whole idea of populism. You can understand the old idea of, of minor m movements that are represented in Venice from uh, the late Gothic to the early Renaissance to the middle Renaissance. Uh, the Trinconato book is, is really uh, very important. Uh, and you just take the number one Vaporetto and go up and down the Canale Grande with the book and you will see all of the Palazzi and, and see all of the different uh, genres of what was being done in Venice. So I would argue that uh, the world is wide open uh, and the world is not going to be helped by you all sitting here uh, doing whatever, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I think it's going to be helped by opening your eyes to what's around you, whether it's in Venice or in Istanbul, because the same thing could be said of Istanbul. If I was to send a group of American students to Istanbul, I wouldn't have them sitting in a dark space uh, with their computers. They could do that in a dark space in a closet in their schools. Uh, I would have them get out and look at uh, architecture because you cannot be an architect without precedent. Uh, and the precedents are all around you. Um, and I think there is nothing set in terms of what is the future going to be. No one knows what the future is going to be. No student in France, no student in Japan, no student in China. Uh, it's going to be something other than it, what it was for me when I started. And I believe the only word that I can say is, well, first of all, I would take down the sheets. Uh, and I mean, you can't see the space for the sheets, but uh, then again, uh, I'm not running the show. Uh, I've done that. Uh, um, and um, I, I really am happy that you all are at least here. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I've been in, I think, uh, 10 Biennales. Um, I don't want to be in any more Biennales. It's a lot of work and a lot of energy and a lot of expense. Uh, and you never know what the reward is going to be. Uh, you don't do it for the reward. You do it to learn about architecture. I have lots of good friends that have been here at the Biennale, I've been in the Triennale, uh, and I've been very fortunate uh, to have worked with a lot of those people. Uh, as I say, with the passing of Venturi, I think it's the end of an era. It's the end of what I consider to be the great architects uh, who were my, uh, one generation in front of me. Uh, and I think now there are not that many architects in front of you all. Uh, and everybody gets a chance to be on the stage. Remember that there's always five minutes of glory for everybody. And when that stage comes, you need to be ready. And the only way you can be ready is to know what architecture is. And you ain't going to learn about architecture sitting in this room, I can tell you that. But anyway, uh, th those are introductory remarks, and I would be happy for questions, tough questions, easy questions, <coughs> whatever. Um, my, my, I can only tell you that my Turkish football team, Fenerbahce, is doing very badly this year. Uh, I can't understand why because Mr. Koch has taken over the presidency uh, and it should be a much better team. So I'm very upset about Turkish football. Uh, I'm very upset about my team in Spain, which uh, lost last week and I'm hoping can win this week. Uh, so I follow uh, things that are both important and not important uh, and it's, the best thing to do in Venice, by the way, is make sure you get out and eat uh, Venetian food. Uh, that, you deal with that after the discussion. Yeah, yeah. 
anyway, so that's open. <coughs> maybe I can just add a couple of, uh, like maybe clear some couple of issues about the Bardia project and uh, also the workshop that we are having here is basically uh, what Vardia makes is actually converts this uh, space as a meeting point and uh, just actually creates a reason for uh, people to meet, like coming from uh, other locations and experience the city basically like in the in early like part of the week and then uh, kind of digest whatever they have seen in, in the city and uh, create something different for every workshop. Uh, so I, I believe that actually kind of goes parallel to what's like uh, some parts that uh, you were mentioning about what my biennials should do. And I mean, I think uh, maybe we can open up the, the, the questions and your comments, guys, and uh, like if you would add or argue something further. By the way, this isn't going to work unless people are not afraid to speak. Um, and they can disagree. They can say, no, they should be sitting at their computers, uh, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm anxious to hear what the, the reason why I'm here is I'm a teacher. Uh, I have my own students. I spent the last week with my students going around Italy. Um, and we didn't open a computer once, uh, by the way. Later. Uh, we went and saw lots of buildings, and there are lots of buildings around here uh, that, you know, if you take a little train ride from Venezia to Vicenza, there's about 10 Palladian buildings that you could see. Uh, so there's a lot to be done because you're here. Um, and I think what's changed is that the, the Biennales used to be about uh, architecture. Uh, I, I'm not sure they are anymore. First, uh, maybe you can come. Come here open. because uh, we have some. Uh, I don't hear that well, but. Um, hi, um, I just had a question because you have kind of mentioned computers versus experience a few times and I was wondering how you see the, given your experience, how you see the future of the profession and kind of like like automatic design coming in, whether you think it's an um, opportunity, a bit of a danger to the integrity of the profession or how do you see the relationship between, I guess, computer generated design and our own minds and our own ideas. As well, first of all, I never concern myself with the profession. Okay. Number one, you mentioned the word profession twice, uh, but not discipline. I'm really interested in the discipline of architecture, not the profession of architecture. Uh, and um, the discipline doesn't require, I mean, the discipline requires learning about what were the ideas that animated, let's just say the 20th century, because that's immediately in the history. I don't think you need to go back to Gothic architecture or Ottoman Empire or you, you know, there, there's plenty of things to learn. Um, and um, it, it's really important to understand what were the issues in the discipline, not in the profession, in society, etc. Uh, I mean, what were the planning issues in terms of, of urban design? Uh, wh what are the models for urban design today? Uh, what are the ones from the 20th century? There are lots of different ideas. Um, what are the ideas of today? Now, for example, um, we, I was having a discussion last night with an architect and, and he was telling us that he's writing an article for the Italian magazine Domus and they, he's, the question that the magazine said, do you think that architecture is an object? And of course, object is the big hot topic 
uh, in the cultural world of the discipline today. Uh, and of course, there are lots of interesting ideas about what constitutes an object, not the literal object, but the idea of the object. And there are lots of people writing uh, about uh, the object. It's one of the real um, issues of today. <laughs> um, so uh, for me, um, the study of the discipline has never changed. Uh, the issues that confront the discipline have changed. Um, and uh, it used to be that those issues were confronted uh, by the people who were uh, espousing the ideas in things like the Biennale and the Triennale. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's the case today, uh, but um, that, that doesn't matter. Uh, I think that what is important is what are the ideas that How are those ideas related uh, socio-politically and culturally to the discipline? Is architecture relevant, for example? That's a really interesting point. Um, if, if architecture is just shapes and surfaces and textures and colors, what, what kind of ideas are represented in those ideas? And of course, the question of representation is one of the hot issues also today uh, and the question object representation and the third important issue is image uh, and there's a whole school that says architecture is about image and I think as students you have to confront to take a uh, uh, stand are you for object are you for representation are you for image and if so, why? To answer those questions, you have to know something about precedence uh, and how we got into a situation where questions of image representation and object are the three most important issues uh, that face the discipline today. Uh, <clears throat> those to me are where architecture is. And of course, the exhibition, here it is. It's both representation, uh, it's about image, uh, and um, obviously the object of uh, making the screen, which is on the wall, the object. Uh, so object, image, and representation are right in this room. How does one feel about it? Uh, I think, you know, What's interesting, the boats that the, the Vaporetti used to be just boats uh, with one, two, whatever. Now they're advertising, moving advertisements uh, for whether it's exhibitions, whether it's for clothing, whether uh, it's for jewelry, whatever is happening in Venice. So they're floating ads uh, as far as I'm concerned. Hardly any more boats. So there are lots of issues for your generation of teachers, students, architects uh, that uh, I think only uh, you all can, can confront. And so um, to me, I don't have any answers. I only have questions. Uh, and to me, the important thing is the fact you asked a question to me is really important. Uh, whether I can answer that question, I'm not sure. First of all, because I don't know about the profession and I never have cared about the profession. Profession's a killer. Uh, and uh, so I, the only caution I had, I was concerned that here is a young person asking me about the profession. I think to myself, why, why is she interested in the profession, you know? Is she a future bureaucrat, uh, a politician? I don't know. Um, I don't give a damn about the profession. I care about the schools. I care about the teachers. I care about students. Uh, I never go to any professional meeting. 
I've never been to any professional meeting. Uh, I don't get professional awards. <coughs> so I, um, yeah. Therefore, I was concerned about your question. Okay? Thank you. Uh, you go first. You go first. And so, hello, thank you very much for coming because as uh, students of architecture, we appreciate it really, really much. It's very, really, um, it's very exciting and also important for us, for you uh, taking the time to come here and giving a lecture or talk. And um, my question is that um, you were talking about the image of the architecture and um, considering like today's uh, architectural world, um, there's this uh, effect that is it's called like the Bilbao effect and architecture is very much concerned about the image and there were um, like uh, recently um, uh, and competition in Helsinki which also raised these questions again of the architecture concerning more of a um, or focused on the image uh, and I was wondering uh, what are your ideas about uh, architecture like uh, other than these like addressing questions of form or aesthetics or uh, the image um, could architecture really like um, um, address issues of like social or political like problems? We were talking about it lately in the workshops. If architecture, uh, other than the idealist like idea of uh, saving the world, but is it possible that architecture could be um, other than these issues? I mean, a way of addressing something uh, related to like social issues. Um, I really wonder what you think about it. Well, <clears throat> Um, I've always thought that architecture creates problems, not solves problems. Uh, our, I mean, social issues cannot be solved by architects. Uh, they're solved by politicians, they're solved by corporations, they're solved by all kinds of, of other influences that have nothing to do with architecture. Architecture is always used by power uh, to subdue revolutionary uh, ideas so that anybody that has a socially revolutionary idea, and I'm not talking about Turkey, uh, although we could talk about Turkey, but I don't want to do that, uh, are in a sense, kept quiet by power and power uses architecture uh, to quiet revolutionary aspects. So uh, architecture in that case for power solves problems, but for those who are against power, uh, it creates problems. And if you look at the 20th century, um, what were the great architectural movements are supported by fascism in Italy, Nazism in Germany, and communism in Russia. Communism killed all of the aspiring revolutionary moments in Russian architecture in the 20s and 30s. Hitler did the same thing in 33. Mussolini, although he liked architecture a lot and supported uh, uh, modern architecture, also with an idea for the re repression of, of social causes, okay? So I'm always worried that all of us as architects uh, subscribe to power. Uh, that is, we try and produce things which the political, social, and economic power structure would like us to, to do, in fact, you're not going to do a building in Turkey that the political power structure doesn't want to happen, whether that's economic, social, uh, or cultural. So let's be really clear about that. So uh, you have to understand that architecture is used primarily by power. Uh, and therefore, the, the, the power doesn't care to let you believe that you're satis solving social problems but really you're not uh, and never have. Uh, the, the, the reason why modern architecture failed uh, in 
the United States and other in terms of social uh, relevance is because it never knew how to deal with public open space. Who was in charge of the public open space? And once the private realm is satisfied, who deals with public space? No computer rendered image in the world can tell you how to solve the problem of public open space. That's clearly an unsolved problem. Uh, and developers don't care about it. They don't want to pay for public open space. They want to pay for things that bring them rent money. So most of what's happening, the governments now in, in most of the Western countries can't afford to sponsor public housing, public cultural projects. And so they give it over to private development and private development is not going to pay for social responsibility. Private development has become power. And once you understand that you're either working for power or you're working against power, uh, that you then realize you're not doing anything culturally or socially beneficial to anybody. And the unfortunate thing is that's what traps architects. So if you get a job, you may be working for the very powerful structure that you're against. Uh, and I think one should be very open about that, that we all, uh, if I work for a municipality, I'm working for a power structure. Uh, in Spain, for example, we did a series of, we won a competition proposed by the uh, powerful party, the Pepe. We were asked to do cultural projects in, in a certain way. Uh, we were supported by the government. When the, rev the other government, the social government came in, they said, we don't want uh, these cultural projects. We want uh, social housing, new schools, etc. And so our project was stopped. So we were working for one power. When another power came in, we were out. Uh, doesn't mean that we were good or bad. It meant that uh, we had to work for a power. Uh, all architecture, whether it's medieval, Renaissance, Ottoman, has always succeeded in working for power uh, and, and kept power in place. Uh, and revolutionary arc, I mean, it's funny, the, the title of this Biennale, Free Space. Give me a break. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, free space where? <laughs> where? Where do you have free space? No free space to get into the Biennale. No, no, no free space uh, on the Vaporetto. No free space in the hotel. I mean, there's no such thing as free space. It's a, it's a charade put forward by the organizing elements to make people feel good. So, uh, you know, when the Biennale is about feeling good, that's when I get upset. <clears throat> uh, I just, I'm glad you asked the question. Uh, and I don't know of any instance of any architect producing work, especially in Turkia, uh, that's for the good of the so-called people. Question. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you again for coming. It means uh, so much uh, to us. Uh, actually, I was thinking about what you said about, like, there is this only way of learning what architecture is about is to know the precedent and uh, to go see and to make drawings of it. To like find ways to understand it. So I, for me, that, that makes a lot of sense actually. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, I think drawing might be a performative tool to understand uh, the, the, what the building is about, what architecture is about, or what uh, in this specific building, what, what has been given as a thought. And uh, uh, just 
like a subtle discussion. Can you elaborate a bit more on the idea of uh, draw, using drawing as a tool to understand architecture, like how extent can it go and uh, how uh, it might be enhanced by methodology? And well, let, me, let me answer. It's a good question. I don't think that you can make a critical work, whatever that means, critical in terms of the, the critical of the discipline going forward. I don't think you can make a critical work of architecture without being able to make a plan. That is an abstract drawing of what the project is. And the, the critical work is in the manifestation of the plan. So when I say draw, I don't mean go around uh, watercolors on facades. I mean, learn to draw the plans, right? The terrific teachers that I knew in America would sit down with a student. And if you had a project that was to do this act, let's say, the teacher would be able to draw the plan that you needed to look at to understand the hat. We're having an exhibition in my university right now of 20 young architects. There are only two that are drawing plans. The rest, because they're tied to these instruments, are making images. That's all they're doing. And you say, what is this? I mean, then you're into a situation either you like the image or you don't like the image nothing to do about the culture, the critical advancement of thinking, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> if you were in music and you were in a school a conservatory studying music composition, right? What would they have you do? They would have you listen to music all the time, not write music, but listen to music and understand the relationship between listening and the notation. The same thing goes for architecture. Listening is seeing and the notation are plans. So if we don't have a relationship between seeing and plans, we can't learn any more than uh, we could if we were doing nothing, i.e. And um, so I, I truly believe that what I mean by drawing is being able to draw plans. And the best architects I know understand what constitutes a critical plan and um, what's the difference between a functional plan. I mean, we can all make a functional plan, a bathroom next to a bedroom, a kitchen next to the garage or whatever. Uh, but can we make out of that a uh, architectural plan. We all know how to do function. Do we know how to do architecture? And that's a difficult subject. It, it really is. And I have my students draw the plan of Raiden Tory. They learn how to do that. I have my students draw the plan of San Giorgio. And then I ask them, could you tell me what is the critical difference between the two? And not draw Redentori or San Giorgio, but draw the difference. And if I could ask you to draw the difference between the two, not one of you could do it. And so what I'm saying is my students only have a week and they're not in Venice. They only have a week to draw the difference. And so I'm saying is the lessons that can be learned here are so great and you have to learn how to learn, okay? Uh, and you have to learn how to see as an architect. The first lesson that I learned as an architect in 1961, okay? When I was not much older than, than you all, I went with Colin Rowe, one of the great history theory people of the 20th century, and Colin put me in front of a Palladian villa. <clears throat> and he said, you stand out there. I'm going to have a beer. He said, you stand out there until you can tell me something about the building that you cannot see. 
okay? And I thought, what's he talking about? What does he mean he cannot see? Uh, and I learned how to draw what you cannot see, okay? And that's what I mean by drawing. Drawing the critical elements of the architecture, which are other than what you see. Uh, the organization of a plan. Is it a, a, a nine square plan, a four square plan, <clears throat> a uh, articulated plan? There are any number of, of, of ideas uh, uh, that serve and serve spaces. Uh, you have to realize that in Palladio, all of his plans, there are no corridors, but yet in the generation that come after, there are the corridors. So Palladio has en suite plans, that is, that you move through the plan, and um, somebody like Borromini has uh, servant and serve spaces, where you have the servants outside the main spaces. These are ways of thinking about organizing space that you've got to learn, you've got to understand what those differences are. Uh, you're not just drawing a facade of Palladio or a facade of Borromini, you're trying to understand the critical difference between it and what it was at the time, what it is today. Um, those are the things to me that are important. Uh, and you can't get that if, if I take you out and say, tell me what you see on Raiden Tory. You wouldn't be able to do it because you don't know how to see yet. Uh, and so it's not fair to ask you to do that. But if you, if I, instead of being here, said, I meet you in front of Raiden Torrey and we'll look at the, the project of Palladio and how to see Palladio, then you would be able to use this to some effect. The fact that we're in here not looking at the buildings <coughs> is tragic. For you, not for me. Um, and um, you, you, even if I took you out just to see Raiden Tory, if you don't understand what it you're looking at, again, it's it's useless. And to me, it's more important to understand what it t takes to see Raiden Tory than it is to understand how to make a plan on the computer. Um, it's not gonna help you get a job. It's not gonna help you get a better salary. It's not gonna help you with any of the real things in life, uh, but uh, you would, in the end, have a much more fulfilling life in architecture than doing these kinds of things. That's my sense, okay? Uh, is it important to learn about Palladio? You betcha. Is it more important to learn about Palladio than the difference between Palladio and Bramante? You betcha. <coughs> is it, <clears throat> and it's the same thing. We went uh, yesterday with my students to see Morandi, the, the Italian painter. What's it got to do with architecture? A lot, right? You gotta be able to go and see Morandi. The day before I took my students to see Courbet. Half of you have never even, maybe three quarters have never even heard of Courbet. Uh, and what's the important lesson of the work of Courbet? Uh, so what I'm saying is there has to be an attitude toward learning of young people that uh, are forcing my generation to help you all learn and to force teachers to, to confront issues of learning. Uh, and I, I think that's important. And without your generation doing that, the teachers will just sit back and like that. And um, uh, I think it's great students that make great teachers, not the reverse. Uh, and I'm always looking for great students. It's important.
Other questions? Uh, talking about precedent and learning from precedent, I think that somehow brings us to the, uh, the diagram, how you understand a building and then maybe use the diagram as a generative tool. And when you say diagram today, you know, most people would uh, understand a cartoony image with arrows maybe pointing towards the sun. Yeah. I mean, how do you see uh, the way diagram has been, you know, understood today? And how do you think um, that it can be uh, useful from this point on? Well, first of all, diagram has come to maintain a lot of things. Don't forget, when I started in, in architecture, there was a thing called the bubble diagram. And that was done by Walter Gropius and the Bauhaus, and they would make functional diagrams and the bigger the bubble the larger the space and so you made a circle and you said living room and then you made a circle and said dining room now of course the minute you say living room dining room you're already into uh, the idea that somebody's preparing food somewhere uh, and it's already a social hierarchy so diagrams don't save you from social hierarchy number one they don't save you from power. Uh, but those diagrams are no different than the diagrams that Rem Koolhaas uses in his sort of magic show. Uh, they don't tell you anything about architecture. The kinds of diagrams that are interesting to me are the diagrams that elaborate differences in critical uh, regimens within architecture. Uh, my book on Palladio, um, is full of what I consider uh, architectural diagrams that are about the architecture. They don't talk about the function. They don't talk about the symbolism. Uh, they don't talk about the iconography. They are what I consider syntactic diagrams. That is of the language of the grammar of architecture. I believe in diagramming like you have to if you learn the, the Turkish language, you have to draw diagrams of the syntax, what your verbs, what your ad, the way you learn language is to diagram the syntax. We've all done that, whether it's I learned English that way, uh, I learned uh, French that way, etc. And you can only learn a language, i.e. architecture, if you can diagram syntax. And you have to understand what the difference is between diagramming syntax and diagramming um, what I would call semantics, the meaning uh, or the sound of, of the world, the world, what the thing looks like or sounds like, etc. And there are differences in di diagrams. Uh, you know, Rem's diagrams are very useful from there. The diagrams of the obvious, as far as I'm concerned, they don't reveal anything about this, the order of the buildings. And so I'm interested in, in grammatical syntactic diagrams, which explain architecture uh, and doing diagrams of meaning don't explain uh, the architecture for me at all. Um, I think that to learn a language requires one to diagram syntax, uh, no matter what the language, whether it's painting, architecture, mu music, literature, the same thing. Um, you can't understand the Turkish language and how it differs from, let's say, Farsi, uh, if you don't understand the, the grammatical structural differences which caused uh, certain forms of the language to be portrayed in a certain way and others not. Uh, the same goes for English. English is a tr tricky language because it's got a lot of words and no uh, much grammar. Uh, uh, German has, again, a lot of words and instead of grammar, they pile words together so that you get words that are this long in German, uh, which substitute for grammatical structure. Uh, French and Italian, for example, are languages of 
of grammatical structure. I mean, uh, we there's a, since I'm a soccer fan, I went to see the Italians play the Brazilians in 1982, and the Italian pink newspaper, the one that's Gazeta della Sport, had a big banner headline. This big said, Brasile siamo noi. Now, in English, it means absolutely nothing because we don't have the grammar to put those words in that order. But Brasile siamo noi, in other words, if you wanted to translate that into English, would be silly. You couldn't do it. Uh, and so what happens is that language is all based on the differences between the grammar and the syntax of certain languages. Uh, and Italy, Italian is wonderful in a sense because they have such things as Brasile siamo noi, uh, uh, which uh, everybody in Italy understood, but as an American, when I was showing somebody um, another headline in the paper, uh, it said, Mu esonerato oggi si perso a Valencia. Now, as a soccer enthusiast, I know what that means. Even Erdem might know what that means, although I'm not sure. Uh, no. But if people know, you know who Mu is? You should know Mu. Come on. Mu is Mourinho. Oh, <laughs> I got it. You got it? So every culture and cultures within cultures have their own uh, grammar. And I think that architect you can't learn architecture if you can't understand the diagrammatic structure of language. And that's the, fa the importance of diagrams. Simple as that. Other question? Any other question from the audience? Yeah, of course. Can't hear. Welcome again, sir. So um, you mentioned the shift in the course of the last decades regarding the scope of the Biennale. And as far as I understood, pardon me if I'm wrong, you criticized that architecture Biennale is today for architects and architects only. No, no. I mean, okay. That is not for architects and architects only. It should be. Yeah, OK. OK? Uh, it should be. It's, I think it should be. All it's right. not for the people wandering around. They mm -hmm. could care less. It's not a, a people don't come to architecture mm -hmm. biennales. The attendance is teeny compared to the art biennale, the film biennale, mm -hmm. etc. We shouldn't be worried about that. Okay. So uh, can I continue you, the question? Uh, yeah. Anyways, thanks. Um, uh, while the number of the people that come to visit is irrelevant, you had said, whereas you mentioned some Paolo Portoghese with Strada Novissima and the different goal of the Biennale organization in those years. Um, more populistic, maybe. Well, wait. What about what about what did I say about Paulo Portuguese's Biennale? I mentioned it as what? And what? What did you use it for? Um, so, I said it was the most important Biennale, the last uh -huh. important Biennale. Exactly. And this importance, this change of importance that you perceive. Yeah. Can you give a more profound explanation about this change? And another question is the more important question. What effectively makes you perceive this change and what makes you think it is more important or less? Well, po Portuguese's Biennale was about architecture. Uh, it also instituted or was the last moment of what I consider uh, postmodernism in architecture. After that, things changed radically. And the 88 show at MoMA on Decon was the end of, uh, in other words, the high point of postmodernism was Portuguese's Biennale. You just have to look at history and see the high point of Michael Graves' career was when he got to design the Whitney Museum in New York and they, he lost the project. This was the end of, of Michael Graves' top of the heap. Uh, Portuguese Biennale was a really important political event. Uh, it said, this is what architecture is about. Uh, 
there's nothing that I see in the Biennale today that tells me as a, as a popular uh, manifestation or as a client what architecture should be. Uh, no context, no, okay? So <clears throat> I can only learn from history looking back. I can't tell you that um, the, the one thing I can say examining history is that the biennales proposed by strong architects, despite the fact that they were white males, uh, because that's all there were in architecture. You have to understand women, when I started teaching, there were no women students, no women architects basically until 73 or 74. So they couldn't have been in the 73 Triennale uh, because they didn't exist. Uh, so the world has changed a lot. Uh, and I think there are strong women and strong ideas that, that I don't think they're gender specific any, any, in any way, shape or form. Uh, but I think what has been lost is the idea that a strong architect with strong theoretical or cultural ideas should be in charge. Uh, we don't have any more Hans Holleins and Aldo Rossi's and Paolo Portuguese's and Vittorio Gregotti's. These guys were very strong figures that ran and spent their time running something like the Biennale or the Triennale. They don't do it today. All right. Um, any other question? Maybe around? You don't ask a question, you don't get any answers. <laughs> any, no other thoughts? <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, we can continue the discussion in the lunch. Anyways. Okay. Oh, yeah. Go, okay. Um. Throughout this, hello, first hello. of all. <laughs> Throughout this talk, you were mentioning this aspect of the, let's say, older generation's strong ideas that now has kind of dispersed or not existent anymore. And this week, um, a topic we're addressing a lot aside of representation was also its relation to reality and different realities that are created. And I feel like the way reality was constructed during that time that you kind of claim as this golden era was also very, very much different from how realities are built that way now. And they were quite clear and global, let's say. Construction of reality was, is different. Yeah. Good. Question. <laughs> Question. Exactly. So you're right. Yeah. The construction of reality and the nature of the, con we were concerned about what was the construction of reality? What you're saying is your generation is concerned with what a different construction of a different reality. Yeah, and I believe Thank God. there are much more, like the spectrum of reality just exploded within the last 20 years. Good. And therefore it's um, kind of maybe difficult to grasp like very dominant and strong ideas as you would wish them to exist. Maybe you have some kind of opinion about this. No, I wish them. I, I'm nostalgic for them. Let's put it that way. I hate nostalgia, but I have a nostalgia for them. Um, I, I would like to say, what can I do out of touch with reality, out of touch with the uh, conventions of reality? What can I do as uh, a person concerned. I can only teach what I know. So I could teach you about how the history from, let's say, 1945 to 1988, what it was. Uh, so you can understand, therefore, what the difference is between the reality of today and what it was then. I mean, that's the reason to study history. We, if we were not concerned with history, then reality is changing every day. There is no 
definition of reality if there is no history. So I'm saying history becomes very important, especially in the condition of a changed reality. And we have to understand, <coughs> I don't think you under, you can teach this generation, you uh, of the generation, what the history was. I can do that. So I teach the history. Do I teach the new ideas? No, I don't know those ideas. Uh, I know that uh, everything is post this, post that. Um, I mean, I've never seen so many different posts. Uh, and um, I, I'm, the one post that I'm interested in exploring is post-intellectual. Uh, because I believe that there is a sort of populist fervor uh, that's animating not only politics, but architecture. Uh, and um, so I'm, I'm interested in the post-intellectual era where we're no longer interested in people who think, who have ideas, uh, but who just make loud noises and proclamations. Um, Italy, I think, is a good example of that. Um, there's no difference between Salvini, uh, Berlusconi, and Trump, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we're all in the same situation. Uh, and um, it's, it's not a very pleasant one, but uh, I think we are in a post-intellectual era uh, that died somewhere between 1980 and 1990 uh, in politics, in architecture and film. I mean, where are the great Italian filmmakers of the 60s and 70s uh, when uh, they were talking about realism? I mean, if you look at Italian film of from 1945, let's say, to 1980, um, it was about a definition of a new kind of realism, a, a realism of, of post-war, of political difference, etc. cetera. Um, I, I think you can't understand, as you put it, the conventions of realism, let's say, if you don't study Italian film, uh, because realism was, was right there. Uh, and it weren't just neorealism, it was, you know, realism. If you look, we, as I said, we went to see Morandi paintings. Morandi's painting is nothing but realism. It's, you know, a set of bottles rearranged on the canvas, you know, hundreds of times, the same damn bottles. Uh, what the hell was he painting? Uh, and uh, it's a really important uh, question. Um, I, I love Italian film uh, and I love French film. New wave French film uh, is really important. Uh, I just saw two weeks ago a new Jean-Pierre Melville film that has never been released before in English. I doubt whether many people around this table know who Jean-Pierre Melville is. Uh, but for me, he's really important for me as a cultural figure uh, in my my life. Um, and uh, that's what I'm saying. I mean, what worries me is the limited scope of your generation's interest in uh, recent history uh, and what were the conventions uh, of that were being attacked during my time, and what are they today? And I think that there's a lot to be learned, you know. Um, I try and, because my students say, why are we looking at this painting? You know, or why are we looking at this architecture? It's not going to help me get a job. No, it's not going to help you get a job. The whole idea of education is not to help you get a job. I don't believe. Um, I, I, I think, and to think, you know, that to help you get a job, you will never be educated. Uh, and getting a job is not the goal of education. 
So simple as that. So I think there's no question that your idea is correct, that this is a whole different idea of what constitutes reality. Uh, I'm not sure that I understand what constitutes reality. You guys would probably say these things do. Um, for me, uh, I guess it was a typewriter. Uh, you know, this is just a glorified typewriter for as I'm concerned. Um, but anyway, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but go figure it out. Uh, it's, it, it ain't what, it ain't what my world was. That's for sure. My world was really simple. Uh, and we had really simple, I mean, um, I was reading the um, uh, last night, this woman who wrote about Italy in 39 and 40, uh, and she was saying they're peasants. Uh, they have employed peasants. There are no more peasants in Italy. Uh, there are no more peasants in Turkey. There are no more peasants in the United States. But in 1939, there still were peasants. Uh, who were gathered together uh, under a sort of umbrella of uh, a contessa or a duke or a nobleman or whatever. That's gone. Ghost. And we need to figure out what about those people who used to be peasants who now are on social media screaming about the world. Uh, what, we, what, what are they about? Right? Before the students like you all, nobody worried about the peasants, right? But now the peasants have a voice and they're no longer peasants. Uh, and they're no longer workers. Uh, we don't have workers anymore. Uh, we don't have communist party in Italy, toast, gone. The biggest communist party after the war, uh, gone. And who's responsible for it being gone? The United States didn't want a communist government here, so the CIA took it out, okay? What else is the CIA doing today? As far as I'm concerned, it would be operating in Turkey. Uh, probably is. Um, so, uh, you know, those are realities, by the way. You want to know what realities are. Uh, there are a lot of realities today. Um, but they're different in scope and, and how they operate from uh, 50 years ago. Sure, sure. So maybe uh, we talk a lot about architecture and I think it's important to make the distinction between, as we discussed throughout this week also, between your personal or our personality as an architect within the discipline and also our role as a citizen within the world. Oh, is it what you're... I, and I, I, would be, I would be interested in your opinion about our role as citizens in the world. I can't tell you that because that's your decision. Okay. Uh, I'm a private citizen too. Um, I, it's always been to look out for my family, right? Uh, to look out for my uh, the well-being of my of others in a certain way. Uh, why do I teach? I am I would argue the oldest continuous living teacher in the world of architecture today. That is, who still practices architecture and teaches. Is nobody else alive who started teaching in 1960? Uh, that is 40 and 18, 58 years ago, who's still doing it, as far as I can see. So that makes me numero uno among old people, right? So what, what, so that I have a public responsibility at that, but I also have a responsibility as a private person, right? Um, and, um, I've always had that response. And one of the reasons at the private person is the public person is because I believe in service. 
service. Um, I went in to go into, uh, I believe that an experience that most of you have never or will ever have. Uh, in my era, I, it was important for me to go in the army. I went to the war in Korea. Uh, I spent two years in Korea. It's the best experience because I learned uh, I was responsible for the peasants. 50 people that I could say, woof, and they would go woof, right? And I would go waff, and they would go waff, right? Uh, and I learned what it was to have that kind of experience, what power was like, uh, what responsibility to pass, and one had responsibilities uh, to whatever situation you're in. Um, and I think that's, you know, something I learned when I was in service. Uh, and I believe if I had, I would have everybody to uh, a professional discipline or a cultural discipline like architecture make two years of, of service, but whatever. I, I think it's important. I learned how to be a citizen with a certain amount of power over a group of people, uh, how to responsibly, in my eyes, take care of that. And um, that's a really interesting lesson. Uh, so I think it's important to have lessons as private individuals, but I think they're personal. And, you know, what I did in the service is not relevant to what you, you're doing, let's say. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I want to ask a question about the, both the architecture practice and discipline. Because I think uh, you mentioned that architecture and I think the architecture practice source for the power, the popular things, the image. Uh, but the architecture practice is what reaches to people. The discipline, well, most of the time is like build things and is for the public. But the discipline, the more important thing that we have, um, the ideas, the things that we speak in the school, the architecture, it's almost like for us, like the Biennale you said, is for the architects. And I want to know this. To the question, I have a question. If you've ever designed a public housing project, right? Have you ever talked to the people who are going to live in it? No. You're not allowed to talk to the people. You talk to the owner, whether it's a city, whether it's a developer, you never talk to the people. So you never know who the people are who are going to be using a museum, a housing project, a school. You never talk to the students in the school when you're designing projects. So that's some myth that you've been taught that you talk to the people or should talk to the people. It's impossible to talk to the people because first of all, there are restrictions. When I did a housing project in New York, I said, <coughs> how come the main space of the project is the same whether you have one child, no child, 10 children? How come? Because the housing regulations say that. You can't change housing regulations. Architects don't change the regulations of, of housing. And you never meet the clients. You don't meet the woman who's got to work, uh, pick her children up from school, take them to after school, uh, make meals. You know, the, where you have no contact with the people that use the spaces. And I don't believe that you could afford to do what each individual one uh, person wanted to do. So I'm not sure that architecture has anything to do with listening to what the people want, because uh, you would, you, that's not what your job is 
as an architect. Your job as an architect is to give the people what they want if they could articulate what they wanted. And they can't because the way the world is set up, the way the power structure is set up is the people who are using the spaces never say anything. So that's the reality. That's a real reality. There's one more question at the back and there's one here, I think. So uh, I have a question about related to, to the question of <laughs> this guy. Uh, when he was asking about drawing and what it represents, uh, yeah. which is, is the, the meaning of, of drawing, uh, you, you were talking about how drawing reflects the systems, the, the grammatic, all uh, what is behind the, the things, as Colin Rowe said, the things you can, you can see. These, these words as grammar, syntax, uh, rules are really related to the computing language as Christopher Alexander made the creating system of, of patterns and, and I'm really concerned about the change which is uh, suffering architecture about implementing computational uh, systems for creating uh, creating architecture not just about uh, form which for me is not really interesting more about automatizing the process of, of design the capacity of develop a program which will create hundreds or millions of objects or buildings uh, creates create all of them by rules, by grammars, uh, probably more perfect as the grammars uh, we can develop drawing as, as, as an architect so using intelligential, artificial, artificial, artificial intelligence. What do you think about this? Uh, if, if you think in a future uh, in which uh, the architecture is developed by computer, implementing perfectly these systems, these uh, rules. If you think in this scenario, uh, I would like to know if for, for you, it will be a utopia or a dystopia, completely the opposite. Well, first of all, I don't believe shooting the developer is going to help anything because that means that the person that, or persons that replace the developer are more moral, more knowledgeable, more whatever, uh, better people. So I don't think there are better people because they, if they could be the developer, they would do the same thing, number one. Um, I don't think that computers think, okay? People think, right? And to rely on a computer uh, to think is not for me, a world I'm interested in. But neither am I interested in uh, saying that if, if only we gave the, the farmer a chance to tell us how we should live or how we should deal with the rural world um, makes any sense either. Uh, all I was saying in the, in the honest world that we're in, um, architecture does not serve people does not serve society. And if you think that, then you should be a sociologist, an anthropologist, a politician. Politicians certainly make more architectural decisions than architects do. Uh, I'm certain of that. I only deal with politicians. Uh, I don't deal with normal people. Uh, I deal with bureaucrats. The only way to build something is, is uh, to deal with those kinds of people. Um, so I'm, I don't believe that I have ever made life better for anybody. Yeah, I've done, I think, some important buildings in architecture about the discipline of architecture, but I don't know how, uh, and when I do a museum, 
uh, the person who sees the museum. Is it better? I know that uh, certain radical uh, artists have said they like exhibiting in my museum because it gives them a certain kind of freedom. I know a lot of people say, well, I don't like to walk through Eisenman's museum, uh, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, what am I to do with that? I mean, uh, I don't design a museum for the painter. Okay, that's for sure. Uh, uh, or to show painting better. Uh, I design a museum for architecture because that's what I know and do. I don't know painting what makes a good museum as opposed to a bad museum. I don't know what makes a good library, how books want to be shelved, you know. Uh, every time I work for a librarian, one librarian says, this is the way we want to do it. Halfway through, they say, no, 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 we want to do it this way. We need twice as many books and less reading space. I mean, so, I mean, what we have to listen to those people. They say, you know, give me more bookshelves. Okay. Uh, then you give them more bookshelves and then the next one says, too many bookshelves. So uh, I, I don't understand how we as architects help anybody but ourselves. Uh, and I've always believed that. I, I think architecture, the culture of today, of yesterday, of any civilization depends upon its literature, its music, its art, its poetry, its film, its architecture. We are part of the culture of today. What we produce as relevant is part of how the culture a hundred years from now will be seen. Uh, and I think that's what, if you're interested in history, not just the past and interested in the future, then you're interested in producing something that will affect the future. Um, what that is, is what I say today difficult to understand because it's it's fractured, it's uh, multiple. It's not as simple as it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And we have to realize that. That's all I can say. And your job, as far as I'm concerned, <coughs> is to contribute to the culture in whatever way you think is right. Not to worry about the curator in the museum, the librarian in the library. I mean, we're in a, in a, a competition for a, a, a hospital. What is the architectural part of a hospital? So you say, oh, to make the patient rooms happy, right? What, what, what constitutes a happy patient room, right? Uh, you tell me. And then the hospital guy says, you, you find an idea, a happy hospital room. You say to the hospital guy, here's a happy, oh, we can't afford that, right? No, no, we can't afford the paint. We can't afford the window. We can't afford to have single beds, single window, etc." And they say, no, no, we have to have at least two, maybe four people in a room, only one window. We don't have any closets. I mean, a nightmare. I mean, the hospital that they want me to design is a nightmare to me, right? I wouldn't want to be in that hospital, uh, but they can't afford the social services that would be required to sustain a good hospital room. Not many hospitals can. So we're, so what do you do? Do you walk away? Uh, what is the role of the architect when the hospital management says that given the social and political and economic services of social services today, we cannot afford uh, what you're proposing. And I say, not only can you not afford what I'm proposing, you can't afford me. Uh, you should just design your own hospital and don't spend money on architecture. And then we get to the question is, in what case is architecture relevant? And if relevance has to do with social good, we are at the bottom of the food chain. We do not produce social good. We produce 
uh, revenue for power brokers. We propose uh, power, uh, instantiate power, all the kind of things that are doing no good. So you got to think about that. Uh, uh, if you want to do good, go out and be a politician. Talent Challenge Donald Trump uh, to be president of the United States. Uh, challenge the senators who all voted for this justice in the United States. Uh, challenge Salvini in Italy. Challenge, there's a guy in Turkey. I can't remember his name. Uh, he doesn't play for Fenerbahce, but uh, he plays big time in, in Turkey. Uh, challenge him. Uh, and instead of choosing architecture, is like going down the rabbit hole as far as I'm concerned, because uh, as you leave, you think you're doing good, but architects have never done any good that I know. Um, other question, maybe last uh, couple of one. So uh, in the start of this conversation, you said that we should throw away the computers and go see things to understand what architecture is about. Yes. And uh, you said that Palladio's Redentore was, is the best building in Venice. So yeah, do you have any uh, other suggestions? I mean, we have one more day, one more day here to like uh, close the computer and uh, to go. Well, um, um, if, if I were here, as I said, I would get the book, uh, Elisa Trincanato's book, Venezia Minore. You can find it in the old bookstores today. It's nothing. And I would take the book and walk around Venice, forget Palladio, just walk around everyday architecture. She does a wonderful job of talking about, and nothing's changed because everyday architecture in 1920 was the same as it is today. They didn't tear anything down. So that's what I would do. And uh, you can't see Venice without Trinconato's book. You can't understand what these things are, what they meant typologically. And that's what I would do. I wouldn't go to Raiden Tory. I'd look at the everyday architecture because Venice is just a full of every place you walk. You just walk forever. And when you get tired of working, you know, uh, have a coffee uh, and, and then walk some more. But I would certainly, the one thing I would do is put away the computers and say, we don't do that anymore. We're going to go out and walk and make him walk with you. That's what I would do. Thank you. <laughs> I think that was a, a meaningful end into this when conversation. Do you leave? When do you leave? Monday. Monday. So you have today and tomorrow. Well, today's not a good day for walking, right? But for sure tomorrow. Make sure you get the book today. Uh, look at the book. Everybody should uh, look at the book, and then you walk. And walking in Venice is absolutely fabulous. We will definitely do that, thank you. What? We will definitely do that. I, I hope. Anyways, if there's no other question, uh, oh, cool. yeah, please. Um, uh, it's really nice to hear from an architect like you. It's, it makes. Um, us as students very happy to say okay let's put away the computers and get out but um yeah yeah i know i know i know that you're not joking but the thing is um <laughs> we always try to get out and learn about architecture which is an endless thing i guess and i kind of think that's like a cycle that you cannot break because of, in the university as you said we go to our schools and we sit in a dark room and make drawings. And after that, no, but after that, we uh, go out of the university fresh and work uh, for an architect like you. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> no, but, um, yeah, but uh, my, my question is like, um, Go ahead. 
my question is like, when do you actually have time to learn architecture? Because it's, um, you in, got my, in my opinion, it's, it's not the right time in school. It's not the right time in, in practice. You know what I will tell you? <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I cannot believe how many of all of you in this room, the minute you're out of this room, get out your iPhones and look at social media, Instagram, you know, Facebook. It's, <laughs> and I'm saying that, first of all, I would throw away the iPhone, number one, because that's a killer. You spend a lot of time on the iPhone, on Instagram. I mean, I cannot believe how much time my family spends on that. I, I never have it on, number one. My phone is never on, and I only have it, let's say, to call Erdem or something like that. I never look at it. It's ridiculous. I'm saying that there's plenty of time in the world to go to discos, to go to bars, to, to you know go to concerts, to do any of those kinds of things, there's plenty of time also to learn about, you know, the discipline. And you would feel much better about going to concerts uh, if you spent time also learning about the discipline. And there's time to do it. I mean, you got there's so much time, uh, you know, and it's just where you want to put your time. How, let's say, I wanted to be, I told people I wanted to be a good architect. I was narcissistic, egocentric, any number of things that are required to be a good architect. Um, I, but I then worked at being a good architect. I have 20 different architecture degrees, let's say. I spent 12 years in school. Uh, I worked for the best architects. Uh, I studied with them, I learned about them. So uh, you, you have to force yourself out of being lazy uh, and just being part of the world, being floating along. And it's up to each individual how they want to do that. Uh, there's plenty of time, I promise you. Uh, I still got lots of time. Uh, and I've been at this game 50 years, okay? So uh, when you've been 50 years in the game, uh, you can tell me, uh, let me know how it is. Uh, but for a young person like yourself, who's not even 30, uh, to say, oh, I don't have enough time, is not, I don't believe you. There's plenty of time. It was very, uh, I mean, we feel uh, very uh, happy and uh, like to have you here. And it was, I think, very valuable discussion. And thank you very much uh, for your contribution to Vardia project and our workshop. And thank we, you. we can continue the discussion maybe later. Thank you. Thank you.